Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our plenary session, the EFSOFIT Clinical Trial, Making History for Sarcoidosis Patients, sponsored by Ataya Pharma. And I wanna start with uh, just a few pieces of housekeeping, which hopefully you've heard um, throughout the day. But as a reminder, this session is being recorded. Attendees will be muted during the presentation. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation or throughout the presentation um, here. Um, and please submit your questions under the questions tab. Uh, and all the questions will be, uh, if you submit them in the questions tab can be upvoted. So if you see your question that you have that you like, please do upvote that so that we can know that that is an important question for you. It is now my honor to introduce our panelist, Dr. Sanjay Shukla. Dr. Shukla is the president and chief executive officer of A Tire Pharma, where he serves on the board of directors since 2017. Dr. Shukla previously served as the chief medical officer at A Tire from March 2016 to November 2017. From April 2015 to March 2016, Dr. Shukla worked in an advisory capacity for a number of companies, including as a consultant to ATIRE from January 2006 to March 2016. 2016. Prior to that, Dr. Shukla served as the Vice President and Global Head of Integrated Medicine for Novartis, a biopharmaceutical company, where he led global medical affairs operation with oversight from pharma general medicines therapies, both inline and in development. Dr. Shukla served as the Executive Officer of RxMD, a clinical development consultancy that assisted in the advancing of proof of concept for early stage drug candidates. Prior to Dr. Shukla served in a variety of clinical development data analytics and data safety roles at Fevor Pharma, a biopharmaceutical company of Aspera Pharma. Dr. Shukla re received his MD from Howard University of Medicine and his bachelor's of science in microbiology and a master of science in epidemiology and biostatistics from the University of Maryland. Welcome Dr. Shukla. I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Daniel Culver, Dr. Culver is the chair of the Department of Pulmonary Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. He directed the Sarcoidosis Center of Excellence at Cleveland Clinic, a founding and is also a founding member of the FSR Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance. Dr. Culver is a member of the FSR Clinical Studies Network, a past chair of the FSR Scientific Advisory Board, and the past president of WASOG. He is a member of the Executive Committee of the American Association of Sarcoidosis and Other Granulomatous Disorders. He is the past recipient of the Bruce Hubbard Stewart Award and the HCOM Medal of Merit. He is a member of the ATS, the AACP, WASOG, and ASOG. His main interest includes sarcoidosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and other granulomatous diseases, pulmonary ovulary protein Teenosis, that one got me, Dr. Culver, <laughs> and other interstitial lung diseases. Welcome to both of you, and I am going to stop sharing my screen and allow Dr. Shukla for you to share your screen, and I will be going off screen now. Great. Thank you, Tricia, and thank you for uh, this invite to present uh, today at uh, the FSR Virtual Summit. Excited uh, to be speaking to all of you here uh, I'm in I'm in uh, San Diego, California. Dr. Culver is in Cleveland, and today we're going to be talking uh, during this session around epsilfitamod. Uh, some of you may know this therapy. It's uh, we've been working on it for about seven years here at Atire, uh, but the title of this session is epsilfitamod and how we are together as a community making history in sarcoidosis as we look to advance this therapy. I want this session to be interactive. I encourage you all to uh, uh, send your questions in through the uh, the, the chat that uh, Trisha mentioned. Uh, this is a session where we're going to take a step back and say, look, we know we've talked about getting involved in clinical trials. I've been involved with the FSR here for you know the last five or seven years. And the advancement of this therapy couldn't have happened without the engagement and the mobilization of not only the expert community like Dr. Culver, but also the patient community. And beyond just getting involved in trials, we want to use this session as a way to create almost a guidebook as you patients, as patients think about if you are interested in a trial, 
around what are the stages of a trial? What questions I might have? How do I weigh different trials? What's what's makes sense for me? Uh, and we hope throughout this session, um, we'll be able to sort of come out of this so with a, an understanding and a learning around not only the process of how a new drug gets developed, but how you might uh, be better informed to think about different programs uh, and 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 some of those clinical trials that are out there. We'll end the session with just a little bit of information around Epsilfetamod. Should any of you uh, have interest in participating in our trial, we are actively enrolling this groundbreaking once in a generation trial. So with that, I will jump into the presentation. Um, uh, this is a uh, first slide here. So how does a new drug get to patients? And um, I'll start here by at the preclinical stage. And uh, I'm gonna have Dr. Culver now, you know, explain a little bit here around how we start developing a therapy. And this was where we were back in 2016 and 2017 when he first met me uh, as we thought about sarcoidosis. So Dr. Culver, um, why don't we get started? Sure, uh, thanks Sanjay. And uh, thank you, Tricia, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, as, as Dr. Shukla said, uh, I've been involved with sarcoidosis um, in several ways, but uh, in clinical therapeutics and clinical trials uh, over the past two decades. And I, I want to echo also what he said, that uh, I think that we're in, at an inflection point. We're at a place where uh, we're either going to see these things take off or not. I also want to comment that while I'm involved with uh, with Epsifitamod, and uh, and I work and collaborate closely with ATIRE. I, I don't get any payment, salary, royalties, honoraria from, from ATIRE whatsoever. I'm here only because I think that it's important that we as physicians and patients and other interested stakeholders support these trials. And so we're involved in several trials at Cleveland Clinic, including this, this particular one. But I think today we're going to talk generically about trials. And to get back to the to the um, first question, the preclinical work, um, I think that the preclinical work is very important. These are things you think about a scientist in a lab working with cells, working with cell cultures and petri dishes, and sometimes with animal models of, of granulomatous diseases. And the reason to do that is for several things. Uh, one is that... Um, we want to make sure that the way we understand sarcoidosis fits with the therapy that we have. And so taking this therapy and looking at it in a Petri dish before it ever gets into humans is really important. We also need to understand if there are some effects of a therapy uh, that, that we might not have anticipated, other pathways, other proteins, uh, other effects. And so those are all things that are investigated by the scientists. I think the other thing from a patient standpoint is that uh, it's much better to know that a therapy uh, has impacts on, on some of the proteins and processes that are relevant to a disease before it starts going into humans than just, for example, taking a drug off of a shelf and hoping that it's going to work because it worked in similar diseases. And so I think me and others in the field are getting really focused on thinking about trials that have preclinical data data that show that this is likely to be helpful in sarcoidosis uh, rather than the old model, which was really frankly, hey, what are they using over in rheumatoid arthritis? What are they using in Crohn's disease? Let's try that out and see how it works. And that got us drugs like methotrexate and azathioprine and, and, and other drugs. I'm not criticizing that as being a hopeless way to do it, but I think this is a more precise way to do it. It's an excellent summary of Kind of the preclinical phase. So this is this is step one. How does a new drug get developed? And we did a lot of our preclinical work back in 2016, 2017, 2018, and we continue to learn more about the therapy as we advance. Uh, after preclinical, we enter a phase called phase one. Uh, and Dr. Culver, why don't you talk a little bit about phase one trials, which serve a real important uh, role and sometimes are forgotten because we're talking about healthy volunteers here. Yeah, phase one trials really are trials uh, required by the FDA, but also as a, as a physician and an investigator, I need to see phase one trials before I will ever try a drug in a patient. Uh, because uh, if something is unpredictable about the drug, 
I'd like to see that in somebody who's relatively healthy, who might tolerate some side effects better than a patient who's got an illness. And so these are, these are smaller studies. They're shorter duration. They're just to make sure that the drug is safe. By this point in time, we already know that the drug is safe in probably several different kinds of animals, uh, but now we need to make sure it's safe in humans. And so this is a usually a fairly short, fairly small study just to prove that the drug is safe, to see how the levels are in the blood and in the urine and how long the drug sticks around. And so this really sets the groundwork then for taking the trial to the next phases, which will be getting into actual patients. Yes, and this is an important component that um, ATAR our cells back in that sort of you know 2019 period uh, ran some phase one work. Uh, it's a real important milestone before we even test the therapy in patients. So many of those healthy volunteers, we acknowledge them uh, the time they put in, and this is to make sure that the drug, if it's safe in animals, we start by then moving it into healthy volunteers and check the box there, make sure it's safe. Then we get into perhaps this is the, the time where, you know, I started to really spend time with experts like Dr. Culver, and that's phase two when we really now advance it in patients, the patients that we're trying to study the disease. So this is where um, uh, we started to meet each other uh, around 2020, Dan. Why don't we talk about phase two? Right, this is a real important phase, and a lot, a lot of studies stop after this phase. If you've ever taken a drug like infliximab, uh, Remicade, that was a phase two trial in sarcoidosis. That was the biggest trial at that time, 138 patients. That stopped at phase two. Uh, also, the, the next one, which was big, was galimumab and used kenumab. That also stopped at phase two. The purpose of phase two trial is several things. Number one, we want to make sure that it's safe for patients who have sarcoidosis. And we want to make sure that there's some evidence that it's useful, that it's effective. And so there will be some ways to measure whether it's useful or effective. But if you can't show it in a smaller study, a phase two study, then uh, it's unlikely that a drug will move on to the final stages. And finally, a really important part of, of some forms of phase two studies is really figuring out the right dose. We want to use a dose that gives the best effectiveness with the uh, best safety. So that combination. Yeah, and phase two is typically, from my perspective, being on the industry side, the real moment where you um, not only check the box on safety again, and each step of the way, safety, 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 you're going to see that across the board. The drug always has to be safe, first in animals, then in healthy volunteers, then in a small subset of patients before you move to phase three. Uh, but from, from the perspective of do you really have a drug or not, this is where on the research side, phase two is the real moment of truth um, uh, because phase three is um, in many ways meant to confirm some of the things you might see in phase two. Um, so now let's talk about phase three, the, the, the real exciting uh, uh, part and, and really the, 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 the place that we've been waiting a really long time to get to in sarcoidosis. Yeah, so phase three is the uh, show me the, you know, that's where you really want to see uh, what what you got. Uh, and, and phase three, if it's successful uh, with either one large or two, two trials, uh, then can uh, lead to results that are presented to the FDA or to the relevant agencies in other countries to say, hey, can this be approved for, for our disease? Can this be approved for sarcoidosis? Phase three trials are, are you know, usually in the several hundreds of patients. Uh, and they take they take a lot of money. They take a lot of resources to fund, and it's a lot of commitment from everybody involved. It's not just the companies. It's it's the doctors. It's the patients. It's the patient organizations like FSR. Uh, and so nobody takes getting into a phase three trial lightly. Uh, that's why the the fact that we're in a phase three trial now in sarcoidosis is really the first one ever that's happened in sarcoidosis. Believe it or not, there's never been a phase three trial in sarcoidosis. It's kind of like you could think about, uh, uh, you know, your first and ten from the nine yard line trying to get it into the end zone. If you like, uh, if you like sports analogies, uh, you have a chance to score. Uh, and and really, if you think about phase three trials, uh, these are things where everybody has uh, a stake in it, uh, and and everybody has a different perspective on it. And at the end of the day, we need to bring all those together 
in order to jointly get something um, in order to jointly get something that can be helpful. Uh, Krish is asking a question about off-label versus FDA approved. So FDA, you know, one of their, probably their, their main reason for existence is to make sure that medications that are used uh, for the population in the United States are both safe and effective. And uh, like Sanjay said, safety is the number one thing. And the FDA, even after a drug is improved, will continuously look at safety. So all these trials have to be viewed by the FDA, the phase one, the phase two, the phase three, and safety has to be established. But beyond that, the FDA is not going to approve medicines uh, that work just as well as Tic Tacs. They want medicines that actually improve how people feel, how they function, or how they survive. Uh, or that makes some marker of those things. And so in order to approve a drug and get the stamp of approval, that hurdle has to be cleared, safety and effectiveness. Once a drug is approved, then that has implications for organizations that pay for healthcare, like CMS, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, insurance companies like Aetna or United or Anthem. Then we'll say, okay, this is approved by the FDA. We're going to go ahead and provide this to the patients that we insure. Uh, and of course, that makes it much easier for you as a patient to get access to that drug. And the fact that it wasn't approved, for example, for infliximab in the early years led to a lot of people not getting access to that drug. The other way to get medicine to patients is off-label. That's the opposite of an approved drug. That means that a drug might be approved for some other reason, Think about methotrexate, which, for example, is approved for something like rheumatoid arthritis. I can go to your insurance company and say, hey, I know we've never had a phase three trial on methotrexate, but this drug seems to work pretty well and I want to use it. And by writing a prescription, I'm really asking the insurance company the question, hey, can I use methotrexate for this patient? And if that prescription gets approved, then the insurance company is saying yes. So insurance companies want their patients to be healthy. They tend to approve things that are effective in their view, but they also have a consideration of cost. So not every off-label medication gets approved. And that's why newer medications that are not FDA approved sometimes are really hard for sarcoidosis patients to get their hands on uh, because the insurance companies will hide behind, well, it's not approved, so you can't have it. So if we have a phase three trial on sarcoidosis that leads to an approval for sarcoidosis, it's really, really, really hard for the insurance companies then to say, you don't get access to this drug. It becomes much more necessary for the insurance to give broad access to a drug that's approved through phase three trials. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also add just from my perspective, um, you know, I hate off-label usage in many ways. I think if the drug is, if, if an off-label therapy is good enough then companies should invest and actually try to get an FDA approved label. I think that is really the goal here. Um, having worked in lupus and other rare diseases, there were off label drugs there. But once you created a therapy that was directed to that patient population and you studied it, it just makes the whole healthcare system better for everybody. You don't have to fight with insurers. You don't have to fight with the pricing folks. You have medical evidence. Um, one of the things that in the early days at ATIRE, when we were determining wh what direction to go with Epsilphitamod, uh, there was a lot of folks who told me sarcoidosis, you know, it's not, you know, we're fine with the medicines that are out there. But as I talked to more patients and more experts, it became clear that uh, we need to do better. And while there is are things that some of these other off-the-shelf medications are doing. Why not have a dedicated therapy to sarcoidosis? And uh, this is, this is I think, really important, um, an important message here. So while we have good drugs, we need to create a, 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 an approved therapy for sarcoidosis. I think everybody uh, uh, highlights that. Um, so this is a little bit of the, the history. There's some education here uh, around... Um, different trials. Um, let's now talk about questions. And many of these questions are, I was recently in Detroit and I was in Atlanta, Los Angeles, talking to some patients. And there's a lot of things here to unpack, but I, I want everyone to look at these from a standpoint. Now we're getting a little technical mechanism of action, the dose, 
efficacy, which you know basically means is the drug working, and then safety. This is important. So, um, Dr. Culver, maybe we can you can go through some of these questions because some of these have been collected over the last couple of months um, and give your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Tanjay. Um, you know, these are questions that I think that everybody involved in 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 a trial or even taking a medication that's not on trial should think about. Um, in mechanism of action, you know, that goes back to that preclinical phase of studies. And, and do we know that a drug can address either what's triggering sarcoidosis or what's causing the inflammation or scarring in the body? And, and those are the things that we get from preclinical information. Um, when you think about drugs that are taken from other diseases, they can be quite effective. We know a drug like infliximab can be effective for some people with sarcoidosis. That is completely borrowed from another disease. So that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's probably not quite as exact as a drug that's, that's specifically designed for a particular disease. And, and you see that, I think, with drugs like methotrexate. I use a lot of methotrexate. I think it's a, a nice drug, but it's far from perfect. It has lots and lots of problems. So when you think of mechanism of action, I think that we would favor drugs that are designed and studied specifically in sarcoidosis rather than repurposed from another disease. Uh, often I get questions from sponsors, companies like Sanjay's sponsor, like, will the patients take this? And I say, well, <laughs> a lot of it depends on what it's like to take it. How often will they have to take it? Is it an injection? Is it an injection under the skin? Is it an infusion? What, what will the side effects be? That has a lot to do besides the efficacy with whether or not people will take the drug. And of course, that's a constant discussion that, that, that companies have. They're not blind to this. I think sometimes I get questions from patients like, why do I have to take this? Why don't they just you know give it to me in an easier way? And I can guarantee you that companies are trying to make it as easy as possible for you to take the drug. It's just sometimes because of the biochemistry, there are some restrictions on what is possible to accomplish. Uh, we talked a little bit about the preclinical data and that has to do with efficacy. I think that when you, when you think about efficacy with my disease, I think that's where you get into a nuance that's really important to understand. Um, I know that, uh, um, some drugs in sarcoidosis work really well for certain organs. Uh, for example, I'm gonna go back to the infliximab example. That works like gangbusters for a lot of patients with skin disease. It's not nearly as good for lung disease in my opinion. And I'm not so convinced about how good it is in heart disease. I think it can be helpful, but it's not like it is for skin or neuro. So when you look at a trial, you wanna say, how well does this trial and the people who are in the trial look like me? That's called generalizability. And if the trial is exactly studying patients that look like you, then you can be really confident that that results of that trial will apply to you. If the trial is studying patients that don't exactly look like you, either they're a different age or they have a different manifestation of the disease or something else, then you have to really have a conversation with your doc about how efficacious will this be for me? Um, I think this last one here is really important. Has it been published? And I think it's a good question for patients to ask if they're getting into trials about the commitment of the sponsor, that's the company who's running the trial, and the docs who are involved to publish the results. A lot of times we see studies happen and then the results aren't very good and it just gets buried. And, and the problem is we don't learn from that. So I think it's very important that patients and patient groups insist on publication of results and a commitment to that upfront from anybody who's doing a trial. You're volunteering your time, you're taking a chance and spending a lot of energy to be in a trial. I think it's only right that the world should see the results of, that, of those data. We talked about adverse events and safety a little bit. Um, I think these questions are a bit self-explanatory, but I think these are reasonable questions you could ask your, your doctors uh, if you're looking at a trial. You know, there was a question in the chat, maybe I'll just address it here for a minute because it kind of is relevant to this. Is EFSOFIT targeted to the symptoms of sarcoidosis only? And um, you know, I think that that gets back to, is it generalizable? Maybe we'll wait until we get to the endpoints to talk about that. It's probably a better place, Sanjay. Yeah, and I, I'll also just say that when you design a therapy, you're looking at things like the mechanism first. And I will say 
that I'm heartened by uh, the fact that even some of the newer companies getting involved will have a rationale of a target that makes sense. You know, our friends at Zentria, for example, you know, very, very rational target that had some literature and some evidence that it could be useful uh, and they developed that therapy. Uh, I also think it's important to then go into relevant animal models. Um, I, I like companies that will look at things and animal models or assays. Uh, there, there's a, right down the road from you in Columbus, uh, a, a great researcher, Dr. Krauser, who has an assay looking at granuloma formation, ATIRE, and even Zentria. We, we've collaborated with these experts. These, these are important questions for you as patients to ask that what's the mechanism? Is it a target that makes sense to the experts? Has the company invested and done some early work? Because I think one of the problems that happens in the pharmaceutical industry in general is a lot of companies are a little bit quick and they try to basically just jump into rare diseases. And I also know that you know, you're trading on a lot of hope with patients who are hoping for a new therapy. But I think it's also important for all of the patients to understand these questions that when they sit down and they think about getting involved in a trial, they basically come with the knowledge that, hey, what has the company done here? Have they done the background work? Does it make sense to you uh, as an expert? Have they published? This is one thing that uh, as one of the only companies that has advanced as far regardless of the data, we should publish it. So have companies actually studied uh, the disease and not published? Uh, that's not useful. Even if the data is quote unquote negative, companies should basically publish so we can learn things. So these are all important things uh, that bu bubble up questions you may have about, about the drug. Now, now let's move into like participating in the trial. Uh, and there are a lot of questions here that we've already answered. Uh, but Dan, think about these were some questions that came out from the field about any trial. Um, uh, share your thoughts here. Yeah, I think that um, I think that when you get involved in a trial, there's a, there's a lot of reasons to get involved. Um, of course, uh, one of it is that you can be part of a group of people who can really make something good happen in the world. Uh, I think that's a very important cause, the altruistic reason. Um, another reason to get involved is to get access to a medication that you normally wouldn't get access to that might be quite promising. And I, I only sign up for trials uh, that I would um, that I would put my own family members in. But I think it's important to remember that uh, from the other side of the coin, a trial can be challenging to patients. There, there's, a, there's a burden to it. And I think a lot of patients really willingly accept that for all the advantages uh, uh, that we talked about, including getting a lot of really close attention from the medical system. Um, but uh, the trial asks you to come in a lot. It asks you to do a lot of tests. You have to take something that isn't very well proven. And you have to have faith in that system that, that they have your back and that your doc who's involved with the trial has your back and is thinking about you first and not the trial. If you think about the FDA and the sponsor, uh, they have a little bit of a different agenda. Of course, they want the trial to be successful. They want everybody to be healthy and safety and to be you know, wildly improved. But really, uh, a trial in another way is, uh, it's an experiment. And, and because of that, there are some rules and guidelines around trials. Uh, so the experiment is, I'm gonna take a group of people with pulmonary sarcoidosis, I'm going to give some of them a medicine and I'm going to give some of them a placebo. And nobody's going to know which one is which. And that's called blinding. And we do that so that there's, there's no biases in how we look at the data. And um, so you're not guaranteed to get the new drug. You might get a placebo. I won't know. Neither will you. Uh, neither will a company. There is an investigational pharmacist who has a key uh, somewhere downstairs in the basement in the investigational pharmacy, if you're at my place, uh, and eventually we'll be able to break that blind and see who's in what thing. Um, because it's an experiment and we want to answer a scientific question, it's really important for me and for the patients to be very committed to doing the trial as close as we can to what the protocol says, to be pristine. 
And so we want to have the trial be long enough to answer the question about whether there's a distant difference between these groups. And we want to have several different ways of testing whether or not we see differences between the groups. And so you'll have breathing tests, you'll have questionnaires, you'll have things looking at your walking distance, for example. You'll have perhaps some x-rays in some of the trials. All of these are ways of testing the results of this experiment. And so what that means is that we try to do these tests in a fairly consistent way, in a fairly routine way. We try to get people into all their visits. We try to make sure we can follow up with people for what's happening to them so we can understand if it's different between the groups. And we try to make sure people stay in the trial as much as possible for as long as they can. Um, now, uh, just to finish answering the, these last few questions, because I think that really answers the question about trying to be as engaged and committed as you can. Uh, we know that not every, you know, things happen in life, right? Sometimes people miss visits. Uh, sometimes people even need to drop out of trials because of various things. So we, we, you know, that's anticipated in the design of the trial, and we have ways to deal with that. But we really try not to do that when we can. Um, the people do get for most companies, they get a little bit of money for being in trials. That's meant to take care of meals, gasoline. Sometimes there are hotel stays and flights paid for by trials by sponsors. Uh, but well, we don't want it to be as coercive. So it would be unfair to offer ten thousand dollars to be in a trial to each participant. Uh, that would, of course, the participants would love that. But the in an institutional review board review would view that as an undue coercion. We're kind of twisting people's arms using money to get them to be in the trial. Most companies, depending on the design, but most companies and most trial designs, you will not continue to take the drug after the trial. I get asked that question a lot, and it really seems kind of unfair in a way at first glance, doesn't it? Like, hey, I just volunteered all my time. Uh, I feel much better. I, why can't I continue being on this medicine? And the reason for that is, is because it comes to get back again to having that experiment be as clean as possible. So if something were to happen to you after the time when we measured the effects of the medication and you were still on the medication, you know, then we might say, well, now we don't know if we have a safety concern here or not. And so really the trial is designed that it starts on day one and ends on day whatever, 26 weeks, 48 weeks, whatever the number is for that particular trial. And after that, you have to go off of it. And at the end, if it's approved, of course, you could get back to the medicine. There are some companies that have what's called open label extensions, which will allow you to stay on the drug after the trial. But I can tell you that that's the minority rather than, than the majority. The other thing is kind of what kind of current medications can I stay on? Um, and again, it comes back to that we're trying to do an experiment where we don't have a lot of noise. We want clean groups. And so if you're on a medication that can interfere with understanding the differences between the medication or the placebo, then, then we might ask you not to be on that. So for example, every sarcoidosis trial I've ever seen does not allow you to take infliximab or Humira, any of the TNF blockers, for example. You can't be on other biologic therapies. And part of the reason why is because maybe there's a concern about more side effects. But part of the reason why is that that might confuse our understanding of the results of the trial. So there are some rules about medications, but we try to really keep those that list of, of um, un, un, uh, unallowable medications as small as possible. Very great. And three quick, quick points from me. You know, when you talk about... Um, Placebo, I get asked that question a lot. Uh, in many ways, these patients are the heroes of, of research. Um, now, placebo doesn't mean you will be made ill. You're getting good care. And as Dr. Culver said, safety, your safety and your well-being is the main concern here. It's just that you won't have that one therapeutic experimental agent because this allows us to see a difference. So placebo controlled trials are the only way drugs get approved. So that's an important thing to mention. The other thing is being involved and participating. We understand that there can be circumstances that might lead to you having to drop out, even just life circumstances, that's fine. But the commitment that patients make and their involvement, drugs don't get approved unless patients participate 
and they participate fully and create a good data set. I can tell you from the last trial we ran, we would not be here at this point if it wasn't for the patients through COVID committing to even continue to come. So the fact that we're even this close to getting an approved therapy, a lot of it is the heroes, those 37 patients who were in the last trial. I, I mentioned to Dr. Culver, we had one patient that I believe traveled from Alaska to the center in, in Denver and during COVID, um, I think was on a flight, you know, maybe by, by herself, <laughs> the only person. But that um, involvement is is part of the historic nature here, that your involvement could be really helping uh, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of patients in the future. Last thing is those other medications that you're on, exactly what Dr. Culver said. You have to be able to say if if there's an interference here, how will you know it's actually really your drug working? Uh, we want to create therapies, we all do, that really actually make a difference and disease modify in some kind of way. We want to be sure it wasn't just some of the effects of another therapy uh, this is a way for us to get a cleaner signal. Let's move on to a little bit of, uh, real quick here, the data we saw in our trial. And I alluded to the fact that we had 37 patients here. Why this was historic in some ways was also, uh, we maybe had better results than anybody expected. And it's why people like you, Dr. Colbert, have become excited about the therapy. Uh, small trial, but a lot of the boxes that you wanted to see when you first talked to me from the therapy to, to see that uh, uh, we observed, um, we, we kind of hit on those. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that uh, when you look at how you measure whether a medication or an intervention is effective, you wanna take several different shots on goal. You wanna look several different ways and you wanna make sure that everything is lining up in the same direction. So it wouldn't do you much good to say, well, your X-ray got better, uh, but your oxygen level is lower and you're more short of breath. That, that won't help anybody. And so all of these studies will have multiple, what we call endpoints. Endpoints are just things that we're measuring to look and see whether there's a difference between the medication and the control, uh, the placebo. And so, um, this is uh, this this trial that already happened. The phase one B two A trial uh, had a strategy of starting off at a certain level of steroids, and then prednisone for almost all the patients, and then dropping it down over time, and seeing what happened. And of course, if the drug eftepitamod were effective, then you would say, well, you should probably be able to reduce the steroids without any problems happening, without needing to go back up on the steroids. And sure enough, that's what was seen. Uh, in this particular study, there were three doses of efsafitamod. You can see them there on the left, one, three, and five milligrams per kilogram. And you can see that uh, the more efsafitamod we, we used, the more the steroids were able to reduce. At the same time, you can see lung function measured by the, the, the spirometry. That's the test where you blow, blow, blow. Uh, in the top two doses, the three and five milligram efsafetamide tended to get better over time. So the x-axis here is showing the weeks and the y-axis is showing the change in the vital capacity, the, the, how much you can blow out, which is a measure of the stiffness of your lungs. And you can see that these two do top doses, the higher doses of the medicine, patients actually got better even while the steroids were reduced. And the two lower doses, that is the one milligram and the placebo, patients' lung function got worse over time as the steroids were reduced. Um, and then we there were several ways of looking at symptoms, and that included fatigue, shortness of breath, and a, a, a more global look at quality of life, which is the King sarcoidosis questionnaire. Uh, and all three of those showed benefits to people who were on the medicine, uh, but not to people who were on placebo or the really low dose of medicine. And I should point out that this low dose, you know, based on the preclinical data, we didn't expect that necessarily would be very effective. And sure enough, it wasn't very effective. So the current phase three trial is just testing these two higher doses. There's nobody on the one milligram per kilogram dose in the current phase three trial. So how did patients function? It got better. How did they feel? Their symptoms were better. And the steroids, of course, which uh, no patient I know really likes, were able to go lower in the higher doses. 
and we call this a dose response curve, which means that uh, the more we, the, the more medicine you got, uh, the more you improved. And so that really is a very powerful endorsement that the medicine might be quite effective. Of course, this is really promising. This is this is a great study, but it doesn't prove that the phase three trial is going to show the same things. And, and that's why we have to do the phase three trial. If we knew the answer to it already, we wouldn't do it. The FDA wouldn't require us to do it. So the phase three trial is really the holy grail now uh, for sarcoidosis uh, uh, in order to get uh, the first ever really approved drug in the modern era of sarcoidosis care. Yeah, and then there was a question around, you know, are we just addressing symptoms here? Our belief is no, we want to be doing things in a multifactorial manner. We know the drug works directly on immune cells, not to get too technical and too scientific, but the hope here is that, and the goal was, let's create a therapy that while reducing steroids, which nobody likes, we also preserve or maybe improve lung function and improve symptoms. We saw that in this small trial. We now know the doses where we saw that, and now we've moved into phase three. So it was a very stepwise approach that we took several years ago. Uh, let's talk a little bit now about this, uh, this phase three trial. Uh, not too much time, but you've already alluded to the fact that we've gone into these two higher doses, and now we're essentially trying to replicate what we saw in a much, much bigger historic trial, the first phase three trial, where we're trying to get you know, 264 patients in the trial. Uh, comments here, Dr. Culver? Yeah, I'll make a couple of comments. Number one, um, this is the biggest trial that's ever happened in sarcoidosis, and it, it requires, it's going to require a lot of um, engagement and um, commitment from everybody involved. That means me, physicians in the community, uh, sarcoidosis experts, uh, and then and then also uh, from patients and patient groups. Uh, if we're going to do this, it has to be done together. Um, and I can tell you that uh, that that there are other people watching. Uh, this is not happening in a vacuum. And um, there's a reason why sarcoidosis doesn't have approved therapies. And a big part of that reason is that companies haven't gotten involved in the space. And we could have a whole other seminar on why companies haven't gotten involved in this space. But I think companies are asking right now, uh, other ones that I talked to, can you actually even complete a trial in sarcoidosis? And I think that um, uh, if we don't do this together, if we don't complete this phase three trial, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, of course, I hope it's successful, but it might not be successful. Not every single one is. Uh, we will see companies walk away from this space and we'll be back to the same things we've been using the last 20 years in, in, in my practice uh, with no real positive advances. So this is really the design. It's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one randomization, meaning you have a one in three chance of going into any, any of these groups, uh, like flipping a three-sided coin. And I think an important thing uh, that, that Sanjay pointed out is that the primary endpoint, the main thing we're looking at is, can we get the patients off of steroids? And that was really input from the patients and the patient group about the importance of steroids uh, and how bad they are for people. So that's our primary endpoint. FDA recognizes that now as an important thing for you. That's much different than before when we used to use the breathing tests as the primary endpoint. And then of course, we'll measure these other things as well. I think, I think you know, there was a question and I've been asked around, you know, we're sp specifically looking at pulmonary. So this is something also to understand. Um, we think the therapy could be useful in, you know, other forms, but you have to start with one and focus on one organ system, pulmonary being the, the largest phenotype. Uh, even in our current trial, there is some allowance for folks, say with cardiac and neuro, but you have to talk to your individual physicians about that. But I get that question often asked, why just pulmonary? Part of it has to do with being able to enroll a population. Once you start to get into more um, uh, uh, you start to slice and dice into smaller organ system, it becomes even harder to enroll. Uh, so that is one thing I want to mention here that uh, the goal here is hopefully to show something in pulmonary. This is where we're measuring things, but perhaps we'll also learn things about cardiac, neuro. There are some allowances for those patients to be involved. I'm not going to get into you know, those details here. Here's the basics of who can participate. And this goes to the pulmonary. Um, maybe Dan, you want to say something about pulmonary and why maybe that is where the place we have to start um, and then hopefully kind of go into other organs. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, this, this comes down to the question of a lot of patients say, well, why can't I be in the trial? Why am I not a candidate for the trial? And, and, and why do only some patients with sarcoidosis have the opportunity to be in this? And, and it comes down to really being able to answer the question with as much confidence and security as possible about whether the medication is effective or not. And so if patients with all kinds of different manifestations of sarcoidosis on all kinds of different background therapy with all kinds of different issues came in, it would be very noisy. There would be a lot of different different signals that might lead to either the drug looking better than it really is or the drug not really looking good, even if uh, it is good. And so there's a number of inclusion and exclusion criteria. These are a few of them. But I think a key thing, because steroids are the primary endpoint, you have to be on some steroids to start with. We have to be able to show that you can reduce the steroids. So I'll stop there. Um, and any closing things you want to say, Sanjay? Yeah. So, you know, there are multiple sites we talked about. You know, we're all a community trying to get involved here. Um, you know, just to wrap up here, how we are making history um, I want to specifically first just say, you know, this new drug was designed to treat sarcoidosis. I've worked hand in hand with the community the last seven years, and I'm proud of the work we've done and even getting other people involved. Um, Epsofitamod is really targeted mechanistically. That mechanism of action was important for anti-inflammatory, uh, anti-fibrotic effects. Those animal models, we showed that back in 2017, 2018. That's what got the respect of some of the experts like Dr. Culver to say, okay, this now starts to make sense. There was a question around international sites. Yes, I didn't put up the international map, but in Europe and Japan, uh, this trial is also being uh, run. Uh, four human trials were very important. Safety and tolerability, especially if we're trying to ch change the paradigm here and get off steroids. We don't want a drug that makes people sick in any kind of new way. Uh, so safety is something that we've checked the box there. Those preliminary effects Dr. Culver talked about um, around lung function, symptom improvement. This is, I think, uh, I think also an important point here. You'll see Dr. Culver's name on that lead publication. Um, this was something that um, uh, many of these names and these experts on the chest article uh, it's important, and I, I would ask all patients to say, uh, talk to your docs if you're interested. To say, have you read that chest article? Put, you know, give give some homework to your doctors uh, there. Um, just in closing, Dan, any uh, closing thoughts I've missed here? Uh, this was more of a tutorial to try to get patients to also understand the clinical trial process. Um, anything you want to add as we wrap up? Yeah, I want to I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I want to thank. Uh, uh, really, everybody, FSR, ATIRE, uh, uh, and especially the patients. Um, this is not easy. Uh, this is not going to be easy to finish up. Um, there, there's a lot of work to do yet, but this is the this is the biggest hope that I've seen so far in my career in terms of uh, something that's uh, close to actually uh, potential approval. And I think it's on all of us to to get this across the across the goal line. Uh, so thank you all for your commitment to this, and thanks for uh, showing up today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'll hand it back over to you, Tricia. I'll also give a shout out to all of the patients. Thank you so much for getting us to this point. Companies like Atire, we, we don't get to this point. A drug like Epsofitamon doesn't get to this point if it's not for the patients. Patients are the ones who get drugs approved more than anything else. So I thank all those that have participated, all that are currently participating, and all of you that are thinking about getting involved. I encourage you to uh, look for some more information. We're here to support you. Tricia, back to you. Thank you so much. And thank you both for this really comprehensive discussion and answering all the questions that we were receiving. Um, and for those of you that are interested in more information, you can scan this QR code on your phone or um, definitely please stop by the ATIRE uh, exhibit booth in the exhibit hall. There are people standing by ready to uh, answer questions that you might have. So uh, please do stop by that exhibit booth and ask any questions, type your questions in, make connections so you can learn more and understand this. Uh, and with that, um, I invite everyone to uh, move forward to the next sessions that are following. But thank you again for this wonderful discussion, Dr. Shukla and Dr. Culver. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.